Hey, uh, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. The Gospel of Mark chapter 8 as we kick off Vision Sunday. If you are new to Bridgetown Church, every fall we run a vision series for a few weeks on what exactly it looks like or our best take on what exactly it looks like to apprentice under Jesus in this city and in this time, as well as talk about some things coming down the pike for the year ahead. So it's less about our vision for Bridgetown Church and a bit more about our vision for life with Jesus, but it's both and. Before we begin, recommended reading for the series. Three options um, for all of you that love to read and all of you that have yet to be transformed by Jesus in the full capacity. That you, that was sarcasm. I'm sorry. I am a bit tired. I love you. I love Jesus. I'm just a little less godly as the day goes on, you know? So you get the mm -hmm, leftovers. Um, uh, but we're so happy you're here. Uh, first off is The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. This is one of my top three. Anybody read this? For, yeah, come on. It's one of my top three favorite books of all time, hands down. I think it is the most influential book. Hard to judge that, but on Bridgetown Church and how we do church, in particular our working theory of spiritual formation or how people change to become more like Jesus and their real true self. It is mind-bending, it is beyond good, it's also a pain in the butt to read. It's thick, it's dense, it's not short. I adore Willard, he's my all-time favorite teacher after Jesus and the writers of the Bible. Um, I pretty much am always reading or rereading something by him. I like his writing quite a bit. Apparently, I am the exception to the rule. Most people don't enjoy his writing at all. For the three of you who do, this is a fantastic read. Um, or if you just want to like flex your mind muscle or something, here it is. Here's a great workout for you. Honestly, this is one of the most important books I've ever read. Secondly, if that's a bit much, don't feel bad. This is called Invitation to a Journey by Robert Mulholland. This is far more accessible, very easy reading, but there's a lot of depth in it. This is the best one-stop shopping book I know of on spiritual formation, kind of cover to cover. He also does some really cool things with Myers-Briggs, that theory of personality and your spiritual formation journey. So um, haters are going to hate. Some people are not into that. But for those of you that love the Myers-Briggs, you're like, ENFP, yeah, like whatever your thing is, great. Um, this is a really fun read to nerd out on. And he just is really brilliant about um, kind of how it is that we follow Jesus and experience growth and maturity. Finally, we just, each book gets easier. This one is, is a book, it's not really even a book, it's 45 pages long. It's a collection of, it's like they made it big to make you feel like you're getting your money worth or something, I don't know. It's just a collection of letters. It's called Letters by a Modern Mystic by Frank Laubach. Has anybody read this? I think this, this is like, I think this will go on my bedside table until the day I die. This is not the kind, seriously, this is not the kind of book that like you would sit down and read it in 20 minutes, but it's not like that. It's more like you would read a letter every morning after your time in the scriptures and in prayer or on the Sabbath and just kind of savor it and read it real slow. Um, we'll talk about him tonight. He was a missionary, but basically his whole life was about inner conversation with God. He does a better job of anybody I've ever read of kind of the marriage between uh, mysticism or communion or practice of the presence of God, whatever you want to call that, with um, just mindfulness and presence to the moment and the connection between that and Jesus and with every person you come across as an opportunity for love. It is, it's really beautiful and anybody can read this in a few minutes. All right, so there it is. All three books are available out at our info table or online at our bookstore. Bookstore, bookstore. Yeah, at our website. To begin, let's start off with a story and a teaching from the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Mark chapter 8 will begin in verse 34. Holy Spirit, come. Have mercy on me. And more than just mercy, I ask for grace, for your empowering presence on me, in me, through me, on, in, and through every man and woman here. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. 
For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Our nation is built around the myth of the rugged individual, in particular on the West Coast. We love to tell the mythology of Lewis and Clark on the Willamette River, or John Muir in Yosemite, or more recently in Elon Musk in LA, this lone man or woman off to make a name for himself or herself in the wild of the West. This ethos is buried deep in our psyche. We see it in the fierce anti-authoritarian, anti-commitment, don't tell me what to do, Portland mantra. We see it in the disrupt the system and tear it all down, the cultural violence of a Silicon Valley. We see it in the celebrity worship of a Hollywood. We want so badly, in particular on the West Coast, to believe that we are in charge of our own destiny. And yet, as the poet John Donne so wisely said, no man is an island. Sisters, I would argue, no lady is either. You're maybe a bit ahead of us or leaps and bounds ahead of us, but neither are you. The hard truth is we're all disciples or followers of somebody or something. The question is not are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? At some point in life, and some of you aren't quite there yet, but usually by your 20s or your 30s, at some point you have to chart a course, right? There are some people who just love to wander like in perpetuity, right? Decade after decade. But most of us just start to get a little bit dizzy. And at some point you have to chart a course through life. And to do that, first off, you need a vision of some kind of a destination, what we would call a vision of the good life. And the tricky thing is that vision has to come from somebody else who's been there and back to talk about it, because you've never been there. So it has to come through a luminary or an intellectual or an author or a religious teacher or a psychologist or a religion or a tradition or an ethnic heritage or a Bible. It has to come from somewhere or something outside of yourself. And even then, that's not enough. You still need a map and or a guide or ideally both to get from where you are now to where you want to be. You need grace for the journey, food, provision, shelter, and you need some traveling companions. It's a very long journey not to go alone. Now, if your vision is good and beautiful and true, and if your map is accurate, and if your guide is trustworthy and wise, and if you have what you need for the journey and you're not alone, you are in good shape. Just, it's a long one right, lifelong, but settle in, keep at it. But if your vision is off kilter, even just a little bit, there's a cumulative effect of a trajectory over the period of a life. Or if your map is, you have the right destination in mind, but man, it's, your map is all wonky and it's just off base. Or if your guide is a charlatan, or just incompetent, or just a little bit confused. Or if you don't have what you need for the journey. Or if you, you have all of that, but you're just alone and you don't have anybody to travel with you. Either way, you are into the weeds. To follow Jesus, best as we can tell, is to place your trust, or what the New Testament writers call believe, in Jesus' vision of the good life. To take his life and his teachings as your map, his presence as your guide, his grace for the journey, his followers as your companions on the way. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, this word disciple is a bit foreign to the modern ear. In Greek, the original language of the New Testament, it's mathetes, can you say that? Mathetes, excellent. And a number of scholars argue, and I, for not that I, you care, but I agree, that a better English translation of this word is apprentice. To follow Jesus or to be a disciple of Jesus is to, be in a, is to apprentice under Jesus into his vision of life. In our frame of reference at Bridgetown Church, to be an apprentice of Jesus is to organize your life around three very simple goals. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what he did. A short word on each. First off, be with Jesus. So 
Jesus, and this is easy to miss millennia later, but Jesus did not invent discipleship. He was not the first rabbi to have disciples, nor he was he the last. There's a number of other rabbis in the four gospels who have disciples. The Pharisees have disciples. John the baptizer does. And discipleship or apprenticeship was part and parcel of the first century Jewish education system. In fact, it was the apex of it, similar to our you know, postdoctoral fellowship under this celebrity professor at this university or a PhD program or something like that. It was a thing. And if you were an apprentice to a rabbi in the first century, your top priority was very simple, to follow your rabbi. That was not a metaphor. That was literal. You would follow him from town to town and village to village. Um, class was not just, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 11 to 11.50 a.m. or whatever. And there was no online, like, distance learning, like, I'm up in Syria, can I Skype in or whatever. There was none of that, right? You would literally give up everything, quit your job, like, take a few years off the family business or the farm or whatever and follow your rabbi around. And um, you would sleep at his side, you would breakfast with him in the morning, and then you would spend every waking moment in his retinue. Now, for apprentices of Jesus, we don't live in that time and place anymore, but nothing has changed. Still, the top priority for us is to be with our rabbi, in this case, Jesus. Now, Jesus is no longer here in the flesh, which he said, if you've read his stuff, he's, hopefully you have, he said, is better. He said, it's better that I go away and in my place is the spirit, which actually is basic math. When Jesus was here in the flesh, there, there was limited access, right? How many, there are billions of followers of Jesus. You're like, I wanna have coffee with you, Jesus, great. He's like, how does two, you know, 20, like 2060, 17 work for you? I have a coffee spot open that Thursday or whatever, right? It just, there were max a few dozen people who had access to Jesus all the time. Now we all have access to Jesus, billions of followers of Jesus all over the world and down through history via the Spirit. The Spirit is always with us. The problem is that we're not always with the Spirit, right? If your mind is anything like mine, it's, I think of Henry Nouwen, monkeys in a banana tree, right? I don't even know, I've never been to a banana, I don't even know what a banana tree looks, actually I do know what one looks like, but I've never seen a monkey and a banana tree. I've seen a monkey, I've seen a banana tree. I've never seen monkeys in a banana tree. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. This is, I'm really tired tonight, very long day, all right? Um, but if your mind is anything like mine, it's ADD, like you're a squirrel, like you're just all over the map and your body's in a hurry. To follow Jesus or to apprentice under Jesus is to slow down and to open up your mind, which is the portal to your whole being, to reach in your mind's eye for God's thoughts, to open up your body itself to the reality of God in you. As St. Patrick said, Christ above me, Christ below me, Christ behind me, Christ in front of me, Christ within me. This is what Jesus called abiding, what Paul later called prayer without ceasing. Right? That doesn't mean like a 24-7, never-ending, like ask God for stuff, prayer meeting at church. Like do the math. You would make it till about day five and then you would fall over dead, right? No sleep, no food, no water. Like it's not what he means. What he means is a life where your anchor point is awareness of and connection to God. It's what St. Teresa called contemplation, what Brother Lawrence called the practice of the presence of God, what A.W. Tozer called constant conscious communion. Whatever you call it, it is the natural byproduct of a mind that is set on God all through the day. I've just been just reading and rereading this of late. This is just like, ah, the anthem of my heart, this book, Letters of a Modern Mystic by Laubach. Laubach um, was a missionary during the last century to the Moros, which is a kind of Muslim indigenous group in the Philippine island chain, part of the silent billion who could not at the time read or write. He's the only missionary to ever make it onto a U.S. postage stamp due to his groundbreaking work in literacy. If any of you in the field of linguistics, he's a very well-known name. He's literally millions upon millions of people in the developing world and here in the U.S. It's still around. His program is still in vogue today, have been through his work. But while academics and advocates of social justice remember him 
him as a linguist and his work around literacy, we remember him for the life out of which that grew. His life goal was not literacy for millions of people. That was the byproduct. His life goal was to live every single minute of every single day with Jesus. Early on in what he called his game with minutes, and he does have a book that is called that, he just writes about how his goal was once a minute to bring God to mind, like he would have killed for an Apple Watch. That would have been so helpful, right? This is way before that. Just once a minute, whatever he was in the middle, of, just to bring God to mind. And for him, it was this experiment. And I just want to read to you. This, is, this will take a minute, but I just want to read to you a little bit out of his life. This is a letter from 1930. He writes this. Perhaps a man who has been an ordained minister since 1914 ought to be ashamed to confess that he has never before felt the joy of complete hourly, minute by minute. Now, what shall I call it? More than surrender, I had that before. More than listening to God, I tried that before. I cannot find the word that will mean to you or to me what I am now experiencing. It is a will act. I compel my mind to open straight out toward God. I wait and listen with determined sensitiveness. I fix my attention there, and sometimes it requires a long time early in the morning to attain that mental state. I determine not to even get out of bed until that mindset, that concentration upon God is settled. It also requires determination to keep it there, for I feel as though the words and thoughts of others near me were constantly exerting a drag backward or sideways, sideways. And he did not even have an iPhone, none of that, right? But he writes, after a while, perhaps it will become a habit and the sense of effort will grow less. Later on in his experiment, here's an excerpt from another letter. As he goes down the path, he writes, this concentration upon God is strenuous but everything else has ceased to be. I think more clearly, I forget less frequently. Things which I did with a strain before, I now do easily with no effort whatever. I worry about nothing, lose no sleep. I walk on air a good part of the time. Even the mirror reveals a new light in my eyes and face. I no longer feel in a hurry. Each minute I meet calmly. Nothing can go wrong except in one thing. That is, that God may slip from my mind if I do not keep on guard. If he is there, the universe is with me. My task is simple and clear. And Labach was not alone. Contemporary of his, A.W. Tozer, another writer and follower of Jesus, this time from the busy city of Chicago in the middle of the last century, said that as we, quote, set the heart's attention on Jesus, a habit of soul is forming, there's that word again, habit, which will become after a while a sort of spiritual reflex requiring no more conscious effort on our part. Or Willard, I quote this Willard quote every single year at the Vision Series. It took every ounce of discipline in mind to just quote the last line this year, all right? So that's maturity, not the full paragraph, just the last line. It's my all-time favorite quote. And he ends it with, soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. What all of these master apprentices of Jesus attest to is that after a long period of time, it's not quick, But if you keep at it through what scientists call neuroplasticity, what Paul millennia ago called the renewal of the mind, your mind will begin to anchor itself in the awareness of and connection to God all through the day. You you will progress to this point. It's not a quick thing, but you will progress to this point where the moment you get quiet, a little mental real estate, a quick breath in between a meeting or whatever, you come to a a stoplight or you wake up in the morning before you roll out, like that miracle happens to me a few times a year where I wake up a few minutes before my alarm, it's freakish, you know? Like that, you're there and you, your mind will just go straight to God. That will just, God will be the first thought in your mind. And then eventually as you progress beyond that, you'll come to the spot where the same thing is true when you're in the middle of the staff meeting, when you're on TriMet in your morning commute, when you're in the right in the middle of the three children or whatever it is, your mind will just go back to God, go back to God, go back, like the compass of a needle constantly returns to the north. 
And eventually you will begin to experience God not as an idea in your head and a belief system, not as an emotional experience on Sunday night, nothing wrong with either of those, not as anything other than a moment-by-moment reality of friendship and fatherhood from God in you and with you. You will begin to live from what Thomas Kelly called the unhurried center of peace and power. All as you are just with Jesus. And this is the baseline. If some of you are new to Jesus and you're like, man, there's a lot to it. I don't get it. And there's this whole post-Christian thing we're in and I'm all new. Where do I even start? Start right here. Just slow down. Just pick 10 things out of your regular schedule this week and just kill all of them. Murder them in Jesus' name. (laughs) Right? Just slow. Or pick one. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just pick one. Pick one. Sorry, I'm always too much. Always too much. Calm down. Calm down. (laughs) Just slow down and just set your mind, reach out your thoughts for God's thoughts. Just come aware of what's already true of you. You're already one with God, theologically. We just don't live in that reality. What is, what is Christian mysticism? It's just an attempt to live out practically what is already true of you theologically. Right? God is in you. You are in God. Union is the theological word. You're in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you believe that stuff? Most Christians believe that. Very few of them experience it. Right? Because one is a theological declaration. The other is a lifestyle. So mysticism, or whatever you want to call it, the practice of the presence of God, abiding, again, is the Jesus word, is just a lifestyle where you make that the top priority in your life. Just to enjoy every day with Jesus, be with Jesus. Because out of that um, comes the next goal, which is, secondly, to become like Jesus. Now again, first century, if you were an apprentice under a rabbi, your goal was to become like your rabbi. This is millennia before the hyper-individualism of the West or of an America. Your goal was to not only think like your rabbi, but even talk like your rabbi, his tone of voice, his mannerisms, his inflection, and above all, to live like your rabbi. As a Apprentices of Jesus, even in our individualistic society, the, the goal is the same, to become like Jesus, our rabbi or our teacher. It's a Hebrew word and that's what it means, teacher. There are three great, great questions in life. Who is God, who are we, and what is the good life? All, every religion, every philosophy, every psychology, every worldview, every education system is an attempt to answer those three questions. Secularism is an attempt to answer the first one, to, to, to create a whole society as if God is not real and does not exist. And how's it going? It's not going all that well, depending on how you measure what your metrics are. To apprentice under Jesus is to, again, place your trust in or to believe in Jesus' answers to those three questions. Now let his vision of who God is, who you are, and what the good life is shape the belief in that to shape the person you become and out of that to shape how you behave or who you live into. There's a progression to our spiritual formation and it's not linear and neat and tidy, but there is something to it from believing to becoming to behaving. Put another way, what you believe shapes the person you become, which in turn shapes how you behave. I hear people on a regular basis from our church all the time, I hear people rail against behavior modification. And I kind of get it. I get, I get that legalism is toxic, and some of you grew up in that kind of environment, and there's just this knee-jerk uh, trigger, emotional trigger. To, I get that for sure. Um, the problem is, like, I'm pretty sure that Jesus does want to modify my behavior at least. I know that I do. There's just a little bit of discrepancy between the Sermon on the Mount and my day-to-day life. Not a lot, but just a little. Like not, not much, but, I'm, but just a little bit between Jesus' vision of human flourishing and how I live on a day-to-day basis. The problem with behavior modification, I don't think, is that it wants to modify our behavior. I'm pretty sure that's a great idea. It's that it starts at the end, not at the beginning. And it's all on the surface. It doesn't go deep enough to the root problem and issue to the core of what we believe or what we put our trust in, the truth or the lies that we believe, that we trust, and that we then live into to who we become. Jesus is after more than your behavior. He's after way deeper. He's after the core of who you are, what the writers of the Bible call the heart, which in biblical literature is your thinking and your feeling and your desire. Put another way, it's what you think about, it's what you feel, and it's what you want. 
right, or your will or your volition. This is the center of your being, the center of your heart, and Jesus is after that core of you because everything comes out of what you think about, what you feel, and what you want. Everything comes out of, the writers of the Bible say, the heart is the wellspring of life. And as we believe or put our trust in Jesus' vision deep in our heart, in our thinking, in our feeling, in our wanting, as we believe, we start to become the become like him and then we become the kind of people who naturally start to behave like him from the inside out right not that there isn't will and volition and discipline to it there's a cross to it but you just start to like act the way that you actually are whenever we do something and we're like oh that that was that wasn't me that was so stupid that's that's a little weird that was you that was me like you were living out of what's true of you And the problem is that you, like me, are in desperate need of salvation, right, from the inside out. So we want to become the, I mean, Willard would say that God's eventual goal is for you to become the kind of person that he can empower to do whatever you want. It doesn't mean that in our kind of, you know, like, be true to yourself. He meant that you have been so transformed and terraformed in your heart that you just naturally want the kinds of things that Jesus wants for you and other people. That you just naturally come up with creative ideas and passion and thought, and Jesus is just like, yes, 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 let me empower you to that end because you, at a heart level, have become like Jesus and have become the kind of person for whom it is easier to love your enemy than it would ever be to do violence to your enemy. It is easier to forgive than it would ever be to say something nasty on Twitter. It is easier to pray and bless and encourage or just shut up and be quiet than it would ever be to gossip. It is easier to just relax and trust God than it would ever be to freak out and worry. It is easier to encourage than it would ever be to criticize. It is easier to live in community and openness and honesty and vulnerability than it would ever be to go it alone, hide, put up a front, a facade. It is easier to love than to hate, to rejoice than to mourn, to be at peace than to worry. This is what Jesus is after for my future and for yours. Jesus really cares, unless if I'm missing something, about who you and I become. You know, Willard used to say that the main thing Jesus gets out of your life and the main thing you get out of your life is the person you become through your apprenticeship to Jesus. Millions of years from now, what will matter far more than our career or our work and all of that matters is who we have become and the relationships that we're in. And the top of the list of those relationships is ours with God himself. The heart of an apprentice of Jesus is a ruthless, relentless desire to grow, to mature, to expand, to die to the, what the master of, spiritual masters call the false self and come alive to the true self. And this is so the heart of Jesus. Again, don't misread Jesus' heart as, again, this behavior thing or earning the favor of God. Don't misread. He's after your life. I have come that you may have life and life to the full. That's what Jesus said. And the good life is the result far less of circumstances than it is of character. You know, Rohr says that we try to change our circumstances to avoid changing our character, right? Anybody in the house? And I know from personal experience, life then becomes one long game of whack-a-mole. You know what I mean? It's like you solve one circumstantial problem in your life, like, and then I'll be at peace, and then it's like, boom, another one comes out. And then you solve that one, singleness, boom, got it done. And then boom, it's another one, marriage is the next problem. And then boom, and you're like, (laughs) solve that one. And then children, you're like, oh, wow, boom. And then like 20 years later, the next one is done. And it's like, you just go around, and it's just whack-a-mole of like, when I get this job, when I graduate from this, when I break into this tax bracket, when I move to this city, when I meet the right person, when I get into the right church, when I deal with this sin, when I work through my father, when, when I, when I, when I, and it's always future. The peace, the happiness, the joy, the life is always down there somewhere else. When I get here, when I do that, when I have that, when I own that, when I'm in relationship with that, it's never right here and now. You will never ever live in the future. You will never live anywhere but in the moment. So whatever happiness is, it has to be here and now or later. That's why the older you become, the more. I, I love aging. My best friend just turned 40 a few days ago. And I'm only 38, but it was like, that was a big moment. Like a friend, close friend to turn 40. I was like, wow, when your friends are turning 40, you're old, right? <laughs> um, but man, I just, I'm 38. I, I love like aging. I don't know if 30 still counts, but I love it. I love it. Like if, if happiness is the result of character, 
more than circumstances, then theoretically with each passing year, you have more potential to grow and mature into a happy, healthier person. And you, I enjoy my life now more than ever before. My point is, whack-a-mole, like that thing, try to change your circumstances to be happy. Oh gosh, it's just, it's a sales pitch. A far better, I think, approach is to apprentice under Jesus and to become the kind of person who is happy no matter the circumstances. Because you have now the inner disposition of Jesus, the triumvirate all through Jesus' teachings and Paul in the New Testament of love and joy and peace, which are more than just emotions, but are the inner conditions of the heart. That's where it's at. And counter to, this is counterintuitive, but to what a lot of people think in the West, as we become more like Jesus, we don't actually become clones. Like there's some weird stuff with music and fashion in the church in the West, and I don't wanna talk about it, right? <laughs> but for the most part, we don't become clones, we actually become more our real true self. The irony of our society is that for all of our hyper-focus on individualism, sin makes people the same. It makes people slaves of desire. We call it freedom to do whatever we want, which is a misdefinition of freedom. For thousands of years, not just the Christian tradition, the human wisdom tradition has all said freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want. It is the ability to not have to do what you want. To rise above your urges, your inclinations, your appetites, and to live free into a vision of human flourishing. Sin makes people the same. They fall into the same. We fall into the same old, tired, uncreative patterns of lust, infidelity, divorce. Yeah, that's really unique. Greed, materialism, discontentment, dishonesty. Yeah, nobody's ever done that before. Anger, bitterness, break off a relationship, yeah, nobody's never heard that story before. How unique, right? It makes people the same. I don't, I don't say that in condensation, just in honesty. Why all of the emphasis on fashion in our society? I think in part, this is not a slam on fashion, but I think in part, it's because sin makes us all the same. So we look to fashion to set us apart as unique and worthy of love rather than to our character and our way of life. But if you follow Jesus, you are set free from the need to posture and perform either to fit into an image or to break the stereotype of the image, which is the new image, whatever, <laughs> right? In order to experience love. If everybody has purple hair, I'm just saying, it doesn't mean what it used to, all right? Not a slam of purple hair, that's fantastic. Oh gosh, I'm just in trouble. <laughs> it's the seven, I'm so, we love your, okay, just moving on, I'm sorry. Just apologize and move on. Um, my point is, we're free to be loved for who we are and yet loved into who we are not yet, right? This is Jesus, uh, that, thank you. <laughs> the first part wasn't, but that was, that was okay, right? Free to become more like Jesus and in doing so, our real true self. M. Scott Peck, who's a psychologist, I'm just devouring his work right now, he writes this, if ever one has the good fortune to meet a living saint, one will have then met someone absolutely unique. Though their visions may be remarkably similar, the personhood of saints is remarkably different. This is because they have become utterly themselves. God creates each soul differently so that when all the mud is finally cleaned away, his light will shine through it in a beautiful, colorful, totally new pattern. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and finally goal three is to do what he did. Or really a better way to say that, it's just a mouthful, is to do what he would do if he were you. Right, I know, again, I'm dating myself here, but I already gave you my age, who cares? And I like aging, so I'm okay with it. Um, but uh, remember in high school, late 90s, there was this bracelet, uh, WWJD, it was all the rage. Anybody, there's always somebody at church who still has one and it's like gross now and really old, but they're like, yeah, was anybody? There was somebody at the morning, nobody? Oh man, it's because we're into fashion. We're so, oh, there's somebody? Fantastic, whatever, let's just say there is, all right? <laughs> and you know, that's a good question. I remember that from high school. It's a good question. What would Jesus do in this situation or that? But it's not a great question. It's a bit unhelpful. Like, 
you know, if you're a mom, like how would Jesus handle sleep training and breastfeeding? There's not a lot in the Gospels about that, you know? <laughs> if you like run an accounting firm, like how would Jesus, I don't know, he's probably good at math. I don't know what, how he would do that. Landscape architecture, how would he do water irrigation? He'd probably just walk on a water if there was a flood. I don't know, <laughs> help people out from drowning. I don't know how he would do it. Because you see, the odds are that you're not a single celibate male Jewish itinerant rabbi, rabbi from first century Palestine. The odds, maybe you are, <laughs> great. But the odds are you're not. So what if you are a 21st century single parent from Portland? What if you're a student at PSU? What if you're in medical residency? What if you're a creative or an entrepreneur or an artist? What if you're a pastor? What if you're a dad? What if you're a mom? What if you're whatever? A better question is what would Jesus do if he were me? If he had my gender, sisters. Like what would Jesus do if he was a woman? How would he, how would he live? How would he inhabit the female body, female sexuality, the female personhood? How would Jesus live if he had my personality type, if he had my Myers-Briggs, if he had my Enneagram number? Jesus is all the Enneagram numbers. Okay, whatever, but <laughs> hypothetical scenario. What if he had yours? Um, how, how would he live if he had your education or lack of education? If he had your IQ, if he had your emotional makeup, if he had your father wound, if he had your family of origin, if he had your income level, if he had your address, your city, your, you see what I'm saying, you fill in the blank. How would he live out this kingdom vision? How would he live? How would he, what would he do with his time, his money, his resources, his life, his mouth? For the apprentice of Jesus, that is the question to which all of life is an attempt at an answer. A clumsy, we fumble our way through, but an attempt at an answer. To apprentice under Jesus is to see our life in this city through his eyes with creative intent. To see no line of demarcation between spiritual life and life. Between Jesus never said anything about spiritual life. He said a heck of a lot about life and life to the full to see no line, no difference between prayer and scripture and church and our job and the office and class and our math test and our budget and our diet and our sexuality and hospitality with neighbors and justice and the income and racial disparity, all of it, to just see all of it through the lens of the kingdom of God and to embody Jesus' vision of the rule and the reign of God is another way to say that, of life as God intended, as life with God into his vision of human flourishing, however you wanna define the kingdom, to embody that in Portland as it is in heaven. So be with Jesus, become like Jesus and do what he would do if he were you. This is what we call practicing the way of Jesus. If you have to distill the vision for Bridgetown Church down into a sentence, not a slogan, but a sentence, it's practicing the way of Jesus together in Portland. This idea of the way of Jesus is straight from the mouth of Jesus himself. The way of Jesus is exactly what it sounds like. It is a way of life, not just a set of ideas that we believe in our head or what we call Bible and theology, not just a list of do's and don'ts or what we call ethics, not just a Sunday event or what we call ecclesiology or church or whatever. It is all of that, but it's more. It is a lifestyle based on that of Jesus himself. This is why the four gospels are biographies, not systematic theology textbooks. And this is why the four biographies are full of stories about the details of Jesus' life. Not just his teaching, not just a miracle story here or there, and then the death and resurrection, but details of his life. One morning, I got up early to pray. Another time, he was tired and went off to a solitary place. One time, he was weeping great drops of blood. On the Sabbath, he was walking through a cornfield. Story, yeah, have you read that? I thought, why is that there? Stories about the details of Jesus' life. It's easy to skip over all the details. This problem is not new. It goes all the way back to the Apostles' Creed, which we think is from the second century. And this is not to slam the Apostles' Creed, but if you know it from heart, it goes right from born of a virgin to suffered under Pontius Pilate. There's a little bit in between those two events, right? None of the gospel writers go right from birth to death, right? In fact, most of the material in the gospels maybe with the exception of John, but most of the material is about all the part in between. And again, it's not just teaching and miracle stories, that's the bulk, but there's all, it's flush with all of these stories about the details of life. Guess what, that makes perfect sense because it is a biography. 
Any biography readers in the house? Anybody? It's always, yes, you don't have to be embarrassed. We're proud of you. Like, there's always a few, not very many, but a few diehard. Whenever I see like a biography as a bestseller, I'm like, how did that happen, right? They're all like seven or 800 pages long. And, you know, it like starts out, I remember reading Lincoln's biography. Like, I saw the movie and Daniel Day-Lewis was incredible. And like, was that even Daniel Day-Lewis? I don't even know. It was so good. I'm like, oh, let's read the biography. And then you're on like page 619. It's like some dead guy in Lincoln's cabinet fighting. And you're like, who cares, right? So, but biography, di- I'm, not a, I'm not a diehard biography person, I'm, I dabble. And so every, every summer I make myself read at least one. Actually this summer I read three. I read um, Luther by Metaxas, which was incredible. I read Dallas Willard, um, and then I read A.W. Tozer's biography. And, but think about it, whether you read a lot or little, um, why do we read biographies? They're not really fun, like, I mean, if you're really nerdy, they're fun. But for, m- God bless you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not Hunger Games, you know what I mean? It's not a page turner. Hunger Games, by the way, is amazing. Don't judge me. That <laughs> is such a good young adult series for a 38-year-old. Um, but <laughs> it is. Don't, haters, you need to read it. Um, but why? Well, most of us, there's lots of reasons, but most of us read biographies in order to find out about the details of a luminary's life, in order to copy or incorporate some of those, not all, but some of those details into our own life in the hope that we might have some kind of a similar result as they did. So if you're in the tech industry, you read Elon Musk, that was fun last year, or or you read Bill Gates and you read Steve Jobs and you read, okay, so-and-so is pro-education, Peter Thiel is against it, okay, Bill Gates does a reading day each week, and like you get the lay of the land and then you figure out what to incorporate into your own life based on your stage of life and your personality or whatever, and your hope is that maybe, maybe if I do some of the things that this luminary did, I'm no Steve Jobs or whoever your hero is, but maybe, (laughs) don't make him your hero, but, um, maybe something similar will happen in my own life. The biographies of Jesus are no different, yet tragically very few modern Western followers of Jesus read them that way. Very few. Most of us skip right over the details, or we think, well, that was Jesus, he's Jesus, not me, or whatever it is. But as we like to say, if you want to experience the life of, to the full that Jesus has on offer, then you have, you start, to start, you adopt the lifestyle of Jesus because your life is the byproduct of your lifestyle. All of the practices that we work through are based on the life and in particular on the details of Jesus. None of them are commanded. Jesus never commands you once to get up early in the morning and read your Bible and pray though I recommend that all of you do it 365 days of the year. Jesus never commands you to Sabbath, though man, I can't think of a more important discipline for our day and age. I don't think he he never commands you to show up at synagogue every single Sunday, though he was there every single Sunday. He doesn't command, he commands you to pray. That's about the only one I can figure out as far as the disciplines or the practices. Jesus just does all of it, and then he says, come, follow me. And that's not even a command. That's an invitation. You don't want to practice silence and solitude? Fine, no problem. You don't want to read your Bible? Okay. But there's an open invite if you want to follow Jesus. Another way to translate follow Jesus is copy the details of Jesus' life. Adopt Jesus' lifestyle as your own in the hope and the prayer of the dream that you achieve a like similar result to Jesus. What result? Well, All of the practices, and please hear me, at the core are about making space for God. All of them, silence and solitude, prayer, fasting, Bible, church, community, simplicity, we haven't not even done that one yet. All of them, Sabbath, church on Sunday, are all a means to an end. Please hear me, the end is not prayer, I read through the Bible in a year, I was at church 50 weeks of the year. It's not the end, the end, is to slow down, 
to open up your mind and even your body to encounter the spirit and the truth of God. There's a lot I could say I don't have time for, but we are transformed at the core by the spirit and the truth of God. Spirit is the presence of God, relationship with God, truth. We have mental maps that we live from, ideas about reality that may or not be true. When we live into true maps of reality, we flourish, we show up to reality better. When we live into lies, we wither and we die because we don't show up to reality well. So we're transformed by the spirit and the truth of God. Whatever the spiritual discipline of the practices, church, singing, sermon, podcast, reading, Sabbath, silent solitude, prayer, Bible, whatever it is, it's a means to an end to open up your mind and your body to be transformed by the spirit and the truth of God. That's it. St. John of the Cross, a Spanish mystic that I've been reading a lot this last year, has this to say. The spiritual life is about making space for God in our lives, a space for God to fill. Because his greatest desire is to give himself completely to us. Please do not miss the why behind all of our practices. It's not legalism, it's not a guilt trip, it's not a religious hangover, it's not behavior modification, it's not earning the love of God, it is none of that. Get that out of your head, please. There is a discipline and even a duty to them, but the driving motivation behind it is loving relationship. Again, that is counterintuitive in our post-sexual revolution, Western autonomous worldview, where love has been redefined as an emotion rather than as a virtue. This is hard to get your head around, and we're actually told not to do things that don't feel authentic to ourself, i.e. that we don't want to do. Holy cow, is that some really lousy advice, right? You want a recipe for perpetual immaturity? Just be true to yourself. <laughs> That's a really great way to stay screwed up for a long time. And we'll talk, I don't, I don't mean, again, I don't mean that anger or judgment. That's, that's really bad advice. Myself is a mixed bag. There's some really good stuff in there. There is some other stuff in there too, right? So there is a discipline and there is a duty, but we forget this, listen carefully. Much of love is manifested as the discipline and duty to make space for relationship. Any of you in a marriage or in a long-term relationship, you get this more than anybody. Every single Friday, I have Fridays off, my kids are in school, every Friday morning, T and I go out on a date. We have three or four hours just to talk, eat, drink coffee, fight, catch up, plan, <laughs> make up, you know, process, connect at a soul level. Every night, and we're not great at it, but we try every night to do the same for 20 or 30 minutes after dinner. And you know, there are times um, when it feels like a duty, honestly, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know if my wife would say the same. I think she would. And there are times when it's a discipline. And man, there's a billion other things on my plate and I have a to-do list stretching to tiger and back. And I just, I have a lot I don't even want. There are times when it's a discipline and it's a duty, but it's not legalism, it's not a guilt trip, it's love. It's making space for our relationship to function as one of the top priorities in my life and for us to grow and thrive together. Our relationship with God is no different. We talk so much, it's beat to death, the cliche of a relationship with Jesus. But think about the gravity of that metaphor. Your relationship with Jesus is no different. You get out what you put in, and if you want it to grow and thrive, and you want intimacy, and you want soul connection, and you want joy and laughter and friendship, then you have to create space and time, and there are times when it will feel like discipline, it's because it is, and there are times when it will even feel like duty, and that's okay. It's okay to follow Jesus, to come to church, to read the Bible, even to pray when you feel nothing, get nothing out of it, don't even want to. That is an expression of your love for God and it is making space for God to love you. It's making space for Jesus, as St. John said, to give himself completely to us. This teaching, and again, this is just, I mean, this is for us this is ground zero. There are all sorts of reasons behind our practices and why we emphasize it so much. Um, you know, the digital age, secularism, the breakdown of the family, post-Christian, this, our working theory of spiritual formation that says Sundays and sermons are not enough to change. Um, there's all sorts of reasons. The main one at the top of the list 
is just to make space for God. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did. That's not a three-step formula, but I think there is a progression to it. And if there's a center, if there's an anchor, if there's a baseline, if there's a step one, I think it is this, it's life with God. It's what Jesus called abiding. This teaching of Jesus um, has become, I don't know, the, the anthem of my life. If you've yet to memorize scripture, I can't think of a better place to start than John 15. Quote, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, or that can be translated abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word remain or abide is meno in Greek, and it more literally means to live in or to make your home in. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this. Live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate or organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. You produce grapes when you mature as my disciples. Notice that in Jesus' mind, he has a part in our spiritual formation and our life with God, and we have a part too. He has a responsibility, and we have a responsibility. As Augustine said a millennia and a half ago, without him, we can't, but without us, he won't. Now, I don't, I don't know what the breakdown is. I don't think it's 50-50. I don't know if it's 99, 1%, or 80, 20. I have no idea, but I know that God has a part in my growth, my maturity, my life, and that I have a part too. God's part is to grow fruit out of your life. You are not responsible for that. You're not responsible for your own spiritual formation. Your part is to make your home in God. You are responsible for that. To create space, to slow down, to do the hard work, and it is hard work of apprenticeship. You know what the hard work is? It's basically this, saying no to a lot of things, making space in your life for God, meeting him in the places of pain, and trusting in him to transform you and lead you. So the work is a lot more like letting Jesus do the work. But there's something to that. Slow down, to make space, to meet him in the place of pain, and to trust. And over the years, over the decades, over the lifetime, you experience transformation. And this is our part, this is our responsibility. So many people are stuck in perpetual immaturity, distance from God, a father wound, a pain, a trauma, because we don't get the responsibility that we have, not to form ourselves into the image of Jesus, but to make space for Jesus to do that. My buddy Dave, recently in a teaching, said it this way, you have both the ability <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's my friend who turned 40, right? You gotta be careful when you plagiarize your friends, you know? They won't sue you, but other things will happen. You have both the ability, stop laughing, it's a really good quote, okay? <laughs> you have both the ability and responsibility to live in God. You can live in God. If you don't think you can, you can, and you must make your home in God. You can and you must. And as you live in God or abide or be with Jesus, out of that place you will become like Jesus, and out of that place you will do what he did. Now, that is our vision um, for Bridgetown Church. It really is just our best take on Jesus' vision as far as we can get our head around it of what it means to apprentice under him. That said, whether you are in our community for a year or two and then you're off to grad school or a job, wherever, or whether you literally die here, right, and are here for decades. I, that sounded kind of morose. <laughs> it happens, people die, all right? Um, our prayer, our agenda, if we have an agenda, our dream of myself and our elders and our team is basically those three things. One, that you begin to experience life with Jesus. You just find yourself slowing down in less and less of a hurry year over year, that you, in your mind, begin to just go back to God all through the day, that you begin to just say no, 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 to things, schedule, party, event, and yes, 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 to Jesus' prayer, life and community, 
In the language of my spiritual director, you move from the compulsive life to the contemplative life. Secondly, that you grow and mature and become more like Jesus, and in doing so, your real true self, year over year. That you move from anger and sarcasm. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, <laughs> This is actually, if you've been around the church for a long time, I'm much better than I used to be. We just started way behind, right? Um, And criticism and angst to love, that you move from melancholy and grumbling and despair, narcissism to joy, that you move from hurry and stress and anxiety, a life of speed to peace. That over time you move from insecurity as so rooted in our humanity and its, its mere twin arrogance to a carefree, genuine humility where you can both laugh at yourself, most of the time you forget about yourself, you can genuinely celebrate who you are and take delight in it with non-judgment in the same way that you celebrate who others are with no competition or comparison. You develop a capacity for brutally honest self-examination where you have the courage to stare into the darkest recess of what Jung called your shadow, what Paul called your flesh, but without any self-condemnation, to see the worst in you, but to see it through the lens of the Father's love and to let God love you into healing and freedom and maturity. To grow into a ruthless, burning passion for holiness to live into a deep place that cannot be put into words of trust in Jesus, his leadership of your life, his vision of what it means to be human over your own and that of our society. And finally, that as you are with Jesus and you become like Jesus, our dream is that you mature to the point where you just naturally do the kinds of things that Jesus would do if he were you. You just, it just comes out of you. And you practice, uh, you know, you create space for the gospel through the practice of hospitality and you preach the gospel and you demonstrate the gospel with healing and you pray for the sick and you do justice and you live with simplicity and generosity and you welcome all and you partner with Jesus in the kingdom in our city. Our prayer is that you would do this together, practicing the way of Jesus together, not just show up every other Sunday and catch the podcast and have a few friends for coffee, but that you would, of your own free will, step into the crucible of community and there be forged to become more like Jesus in yourself. As you all know, Bridgetown communities are the heartbeat of our church. And finally, that you would do this in Portland, that you would take this city seriously, that you would live here if you don't, that you would move into the neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson translated John chapter one and Jesus, that you would share this city's joy, its coffee, its emerging kombucha scene, its uh, like (laughs) urban planning, and you'd share its pain. Winter is coming, right? (laughs) That you would share its the gap between rich and poor, its history of racism, its property taxes, all of that, and that you would take spiritual responsibility for the city that we call home to see the kingdom of God come in Portland as it is in heaven. This is our vision. Really, it's just our best take on Jesus' vision for life with him as a community that we call the church, and all of you are invited. Let's stand together and pray. Take a seat. We're not done. And uh, we're still not done. We just want to let you know to end our time. It won't take that long. But we just want to let you know. We're at Gerald and Bethany coming up, you too. We just want to let you know about what is coming down the pipeline for the year ahead. Um, Five things we want you to know about. First off, our practices for the next 12 months. A lot of you are asking about that. We have four up on the docket, one kind of every two or three months. Next up is fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. So come on. That's it. And like, you know, the seven's really pumped. Like, let's kill Satan. Like, whatever. <laughs> um, okay, we'll talk about that. Um, so we kick that off two weeks from tonight on September 30th. In the Christian tradition, there are three historic enemies of the soul is the language that has been used through church history, the world, the flesh, the devil. And so we'll talk in depth about each one and come with practices to kind of fight. And so this is kind of what in the charismatic tradition is called spiritual warfare, but a bit on steroids and very different than what you may expect. Um, I think a lot of what we think of as spiritual warfare is 
not untrue, it's just missing 90% of what the bulk is, which is about the truth of the lies that we believe from the deceiver. Secondly, about this New Testament idea of the flesh, which is one of, I think, the most important and least talked about ideas in all of the New Testament, especially for our do what feels good, be true to yourself kind of society. And then finally, we'll talk about um, what the New Testament writers call the world, and most of us millennials just call culture. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Um, so we'll talk about all of that. I cannot wait to teach on Lucifer and other things um, all fall long. Then in January, that is all falls, like 13 teachings and a bunch of practices. And then in January, we on the docket for that is Sabbath. And so we plan just to sit for three months just to like rest our way through winter, right? Hibernation kind of, you know, but more than that to really just sit in and savor what is, I think, one of the most upstream disciplines for our time and age. And in my own life, it is one of, if not the most important. And uh, then in the spring, we're doing a practice working title is naming your stage of life and uh, season of life and stage of apprenticeship. So we'll talk about theories of psychological and spiritual development. We'll talk about first half, second half of life. We'll talk about aging. I'm an expert on the subject. Um, No, we'll bring in somebody older for that. And uh, we'll talk about active and passive spirituality. I've never taught on that before. We'll talk about the dark night of the soul. I've never talked about that before. And uh, we'll run a kind of concurrent series on marriage and on parenting and on singleness. We'll do hopefully another Enneagram conference in the spring, some really cool stuff. And then on the docket right now, placeholder for next summer, I think, is preaching the gospel. Well, we'll talk about what the gospel is, what it isn't, and what the heck does it look like to preach it in this day and age. Those are the practices. Secondly, Bethany Allen, you are leading the Apprentice Cohort. I first am. time ever this first year. First time ever, and maybe my last, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Words of faith. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. It's so late. Uh, the faith is waning. Um, yeah, if you guys aren't totally sure what the Apprentice Cohort is, it is a nine-month-long journey that 45 of uh, people at Bridgetown, all of us, we're going to take. Um, and we're going to press into the spiritual um, disciplines. We're going to press into the practices. We're going to press into emotionally healthy spirituality. And we're going to do it all at 7 a.m. And um, throughout, the, throughout the year for nine months, it's going to be so rad, so awesome. We kick off Friday night. And we're really, really excited. Um, And with that, um, if you are in the Apprentice cohort, and you know that you are, would you mind standing for us just a second? Anybody? Yeah. There you go. Love it. Great. Five people in this gathering. Love it. So here's what we want to do. We want to pray for these guys, because they're about to embark on a, a totally intense but wonderful journey. So is it okay? Would you mind um, just stretching your hand in their direction if someone's near you, touching them if they're close by but appropriately. And we're going to um, pray that Jesus blesses them on their journey. We're so excited. This is a new thing. and We really do hope to do it for years to come. Um, but this is just a special moment. So Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would bless each person who's about to step out really in faith towards you to the deeper things of God. Father, we pray that their experience and their encounter with you would be transformative in their life and in the life of the church. And Father, we do just pray that you'd embolden them, that you'd give them power from the Holy Spirit um, to, to explore and to experience you in ways that they haven't yet. So would you do all of that? Father, we just ask your favor, your blessing over them and over this next nine months, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, yeah. And, uh, and Gesundheit, <laughs> which you know, nerd fact is an ancient German word because they believe that a sneeze was an exorcism of a demon leaving your body. So you just had a, an exorcism. You, you just are amazing. <laughs> Speaking of fighting Satan, <laughs> Gesundheit. It's um, coming out. <laughs> third, we are running basics in two weeks. We had a ton of people move to the city over the summer and are, who are ready to join our church. So we have over 200 people signed up, and, uh, which is amazing. 
all of whom are new to our church and or ready to step into a community in their neighborhood. And that's still two weeks out. Uh, we will most likely have a bunch of people still sign up. It's not too late to sign up. Um, we only run this three times a year. It's on like a semester series. So if you miss this, the next one's in January and then April. So um, basically three times a year, we run this kind of class sash training and it's to pastor people into a community in your neighborhood. So we have over 200 people that are ready to take that step to practice the way of Jesus together around a table. The way we practice the Lord's Supper now is as a full meal around a table, not as a cracker and juice around a stage, not to disparage that. And so this is a really big deal. So we're really excited. If you are either signed up for basics or you plan, you're like, oh yeah, you plan to sign up and show up in two weeks, would you just stand? We just wanna, again, pray for you. No debit card number, embarrassing story, none of that. Just would you stand up if you're in this gathering and you're signed up for basics. Wonderful, stay standing. Wonderful, thank you, make some noise. Stay standing. Um, okay, all of you around, as to quote Bethany Allen, lay a hand on appropriately. And would you just, I want you to, now you're on prayer team, not me. I just want all of you out loud at once. And if you're not close enough to put a hand on a shoulder, just stretch your hand out from 20 feet away, use the force, whatever. And um, I just want you to pray blessing. This is a scary moment for a lot of people. It's a key moment. It's a life-changing moment to step into community. It can be really hard, really good. Let's pray for both, but mostly the second one. Um, we just pray blessing, all right? You have 30 seconds, three, two, pray. Amen. Great, go ahead and have a seat. The next really important thing you need to know is Alpha. We do Alpha three times a year, fall, winter, and spring. And um, Alpha is just a third space for people who don't already believe what we believe. They don't already follow Jesus. If you have questions, doubts, if you've been hurt by the church or hurt by religion and you're frustrated and you're angry, that Alpha is a great space to even bring that. And it centers around this meal. We meet um, right next door in the annex where the coffee is right there. We have great hospitality, a great meal, and just an open environment for people to come and explore faith. Ask absolutely anything that they want. So we start that on the 26th, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday night. And it's really interesting. Here at Bridgetown, we've done it for a couple years already, and we have great leaders. We actually don't need any more leaders. We turn some of the leaders away. But what we really need is more of an invitation. And what we're asking is just that even right now, we'll create space to listen to the Spirit, and that you would just listen and ask God, is there one person that's already in your life um, that doesn't follow Jesus, that um, God maybe is already at work in them. We're just going to take, kind of create space that God would bring one person to mind, and we would just um, ask you to consider inviting them. Um, this is an opportunity for us. So let's just create this space right now. Would you, um, God, we just ask right now that you would um, just bring someone to mind that we already know, someone maybe that we're going to see tomorrow. Would you bring their face to mind, their name to mind? And then God, would you give us the boldness to invite them and maybe even to bring them to the first week. But God, we pray for an incredible harvest of people that are living without your love, that you would draw them into your love through Alpha this fall, we pray. Yeah. Amen. Amen, thank you. All right, finally, we said that we have a very special announcement for you this Sunday, and we too, last one on the docket. So. A year ago, in our vision series, last fall, we officially announced that we are on the hunt to buy or receive or whatever an old church building somewhere in the city center. Stay here at First Baptist on Sunday nights or whatever, but to get something for all sorts of reasons. A few months later, Dan Anderson, who I think is out of town this weekend, teacher at Grant High School, has a little side hustle as a real estate agent, you know, in summers, weekend kind of thing. 
and uh, which, which becomes important, is at the gym in Northeast and gets to talking to this older gentleman on the machine next to him. This older gentleman turns out is the pastor of Holiday Park Church of God, a historic kind of church in the city. This um, beautiful community is down to about 25 people on a Sunday. They can't quite afford to keep up that large of a building. They're starting to kind of wind down. Thus began a six month conversation of a lot of like eggs on toast at Proud Mary with Gerald, my Myself and Pastor Martin, um, as well as a congregational meeting, and our team has spent a lot of time with the church, a beautiful community. This is it, Holiday Park Church of God. It's right on the corner of Northeast 21st and Tillamook, so right on that bike path. Any of you who live in Northeast or Central East Side and you commute to downtown, you cycle past it every single day. This is a, a shot of the kind of go back one. That's that's just money. It's this like mid-century modern gem. It's so other than a lot of purple and teal, it's really cool. Um, we think there are seats for around, with a minor remodel, six or 700 people, which in the city center, that is gigantic. There, um, the building itself is 35,000 square feet. It has two parking, there's a chapel off to the side right here. Some of you are ready to get married. There you are, there, there it is. There's your, like, yes, I imagine it with Ivy, and there it is, right? Um, <laughs> It has two parking lots, which all of the parents in the house are freaked out about so much. It has space for a community garden, has an outdoor courtyard. It has a 6,000 square foot kind of daylight basement fellowship hall, not including the industrial kitchen, right off of it, space for offices, children's ministry galore. All of that is pretty spectacular. Long story short, this community knows that they are dying and they're open and honest about that. And they want to die in such a way that like Jesus, their death um, is a source of life for the next generation. They have said, uh, we had a meeting there, an open house there this afternoon for the morning gathering on the east side, and the pastor was there and he said it again, I think it's the sixth time I've heard him say it, you are doing as a church what we wanted to do. And if we were to do this, we would see this as us passing the baton to you in this building, in this neighborhood, and the kingdom of God. So basically, they have offered to sell us the building at a pretty significantly reduced rate. So the price point is $3 million. It's worth, I don't know, about three or more times than that, just for the land alone and that close proximity to the city. They, in turn, plan to give pretty much all of that money away to missionaries and mission organizations. The lead pastor is a stunning, humble dude. He basically is advocating for the end of his job, and he is, I think, around 60, so that's not like a great age to go find another job, and he's still, like, out of faith advocating for us for this to happen, so they want to give him, I think, a year kind of severance to kind of figure that out. Other than that, every penny would go to missionaries and mission organizations, so if we do this, it'd be kind of cool. We'd be raising money to buy a building for our church, but then also to expand the kingdom around the world. Now, of course, this raises the question, why a building? We're in a not half bad one right now as we speak. This building is beautiful, and to clarify, we don't intend to leave First Baptist. This is where we started. There have been multiple prophetic words over us in this building for long before we were even here. There is a chance that we, right now we do one gathering on the east side and two on the west side. There is a chance that we would flip that if we had a space that was our own and one gathering here and two in the east side. But again, that would be an open conversation that we would decide together as a community. So we have First Baptist if you've ever been to Old Laurelhurst on Sunday mornings, it's no parking, but it's beautiful, and I love that space. So why a building, $3 million is yes, deal of a lifetime, but it's still $3 million. So that's a lot. Why do this? Well, there are three major reasons that we see. There's more, but three major ones. One, buildings like this are, and this might strike you as odd, but for me, this is the top reason. Buildings like this are symbols to the city. Our city is known all over the world as this post-Christian hub, and it is dotted all through the urban core, you know this, by old church buildings. And these buildings were designed to preach the gospel with architecture. There is a steeple that in original city code was the highest point in each neighborhood. At the top of most of the steeples, this one included, is a cross right there. It is designed not just as a landmark, but as a symbol 
But tragically, these symbols through decline, the life cycle of kind of aging and all of that in every local church, these buildings are often tragically more symbols not of the life of the gospel but of the death of the gospel. Every time one is sold off and either torn down to make way for a condo tower or worse, turned into a McMenamin's, or um, <laughs> you're like, well, at least there's beer, okay? Um, or a theater, or a music venue, or a yoga studio, or I think every time I drive down 84th and I see that old, that w- what was the Luth- historic Lutheran church in town, now it's like that pastel color, it's become a Buddhist temple, and I'm sure there are great people there who do great things, but every time I pass that, a part of me dies. That is a tragedy for, this, for Jesus and his name and his kingdom in this city. It is a symbol to our city that says with architecture, the church, the gospel, Jesus and his people are a part of your past, but not a part of your future, and we do not believe that. I personally am of the opinion that we, not we Bridgetown, but we the church in Portland, every church here, we have a spiritual responsibility to the best of our ability to keep the stewardship of these church buildings in the hands of the church of God, long term. So if we were to do this, we would follow our friends at Imago Day's example. We would not even own this building. We'd actually put it into a trust to where if our church ever got down to a certain size, it would automatically go to another church plant in the city. So it's always used in perpetuity for generations as long as it's there for the kingdom as a symbol. So the main reason would be to kind of capture or recapture this building as a symbol right on that bike path. The hundreds, thousands of people go by every day to work downtown as a symbol to the city that Jesus is very much a part of the future of this city as are his people. Secondly, this will enable us to expand the breadth of our work to a more holistic, integrated model of church. Right now, we rent out these two beautiful buildings and a tiny little office space that looks really cool on Instagram, if you've ever been there. But if you're an employee at our church, you know that there are 16 people working out of a tiny little 1,000 square foot open room. And so um, that limits us, and again, it's not the first world problems, right? But it limits us to basically Sundays, home communities, and the occasional event. Now, we're pretty simple in our kind of model of church, so that's okay, but man, if we had our own space, it would just open up a whole range of possibilities. Some of our dreams, and we haven't even like started to bring you all in on the process yet, are, for example, a justice center in that 6,000 square foot kind of fellowship hall in the daylight basement. We would love to do um, a center and collection center for Refugee Care Collective, which is an amazing nonprofit that started out of our church. We love to give free office space to them and other nonprofits. I mean, Megan was at our meeting this afternoon just a little bit in tears about that dream. We'd love to open essentially, I don't know what to call it, but a department store with food and clothing and necessities for refugee families, foster families, foster children, people in need in our church, in the neighborhood, in the city, food, all of that, where they can come in and actually go shopping and restore dignity to them. We'd love to open up space for a warming center for our neighbors that don't have homes in the winter. There's work um, up in one wing of the building for a co-working space. There's plenty of room to start a co-working business, to create space for entrepreneurs, creatives, freelancers, answers, Christian or not, to work for the common good of our city. We'd love to convert the children's room. There's already a school that rents out the bottom. That's a great use of that. Up top, we'd love to convert a lot of the children's space to a mixed use to a visitation center for DHS. The DHS office that we already serve is just a few blocks away, and they're in desperate need of a visitation room, which is where a mom or a dad that has been separated from a child by the state has a chance to come back into relationship. We would love, and most of the rooms are just pretty dingy. We'd love to just create a beautiful space and good coffee and gluten-free cookies and all of that, whatever, and somebody there, a volunteer team, just to welcome people, pray, practice hospitality. As I said, there um, is space for a community garden. There's supposed to have space to host community events. There are two parking lots, and we'll keep the parking, but we're already dreaming about what to do with the space above the parking. Um, my wife and I in our community have been dreaming for a number of years about this idea of I don't know, an urban domestic monastery in the city where us and our community and maybe 10 or 20 of you would move in together to a co-housing, not communal housing, but co-housing, 
I'm too introverted for communal, but co-housing. And we would um, come up with a rule of life, basically take practicing the way to the next level, come up with a rule of life, Sabbath, justice initiative, create some subsidized housing for refugee families or people in need, a hospitality space, so on and so forth. We could host conferences, multiple conferences. We were asked to host this coming year. We had to decline because we could not get the building. We have Holy Spirit Conference, which we can't wait for, but there was this huge miscommunication and we actually can't get First Baptist at the right date, and so now we're scrambling. We have teachers already lined up, and again, first world problems, we're just fine, right? Our church is doing great, but man, there's just so much more that we could do, and so much more breadth, in particular on the justice stuff, if we had our own space. Finally, last reason, this will give us a more rooted presence in the city. Um, a lot of you at the seven are still pretty young, but not all of you are, and a lot of you know from experience, some of us know from experience, there's just a difference between owning and renting, and it's less about money or materialism, it's more emotional. To, to feel at home in a place, you have to at least have the prospect of staying there for a long time. And we love First Baptist. We hope to be here long term, as long as they will have us. And we love OLC on Sunday mornings, but we live like under the guillotine, like we just don't know. At any point, the lease is up and we have outstayed our welcome or whatever. And again, that's fine. We're, there's no fear, but we just live in that. And this just feels like a great spot. Again, we would keep First Baptist, keep at least least one, if not both, Sunday gatherings here. We feel called to the west side of the city as well as to the east. But man, this is literally, it is on the dividing line between Irvington. So on one side of the building is all like million plus dollar homes, all old Portland, people that have been in the city for decades or for generations. It's beautiful. On the other side is Sullivan, Sullivan's Gulch, which is all apartments. There's a ton of sex trafficking in there. There's a ton of justice work in there. Um, there's a lot of people that are new, transplants to the city, a lot of just kind of mid range apartments for young couples or single people so it's right at this cross section and it feels really right for even the ethos and the demographic of our church so all that to say listen carefully the announcement is not hey everybody we're buying holiday park and you're paying for it yay 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 that's not the announcement rather it's hey everybody here is what we think is an amazing opportunity that we're dreaming about, and what do you think? We want you to help us make this decision. Rather than come off the mountain and announce to you, this is what God has for us, and you are going to pay for it. Rather than that, we want to just come openly and honestly and say, here's the thing. We want to invite you into the discernment and the decision. Our elder, that said, and there's zero emotional manipulation here, I promise, but our elders, our board of directors, and our staff are at this point all in unanimous agreement that to the best of our ability to discern the will of God, this feels like an amazing opportunity. Three million bucks is a lot of money, but it's a deal of a lifetime for this space. It feels like the right time for our church, like we're ready to flex our faith muscle, or at least work out our faith muscle a little bit, ready to grow. A lot of you are young. You've been around for the church for a few years. You're starting to make money. You're in a career. This is time for all of us to grow in generosity. And so again, we don't have, like we're not Moses on the mountain. I don't have like a tablet at home from the finger of God, like by Holiday Park. Like God, you have great handwriting. It's fantastic. It's in Helvetica. <laughs> Love it. I don't, <laughs> I don't have that. It's more like, you know, that story in the book of Acts where the leaders stand up and say, quote, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So it seems good to our leadership. It seems good to the whole, we think to the Holy Spirit and to us, but again, we are human. And so we want you to discern with us and to confirm and or correct what we sense God is saying with this opportunity. To that end, we um, did one this afternoon that you missed because you had no idea what was going on, but this coming Wednesday night, we are hosting an open house at 6.30 p.m. The address, is it up there? Yep, right there. Hosting an open house come walk through the whole building, glory in the teal carpet and the purple pew, all of it, and um, walk through it, kick the tires, so to speak. Don't actually kick anything, but walk through it and get a feel for it. We'll have staff in every corner of the building to kind of answer questions, kind of lay out a vision for what we think is possible with this part of the building. Then at seven o'clock, we will circle up. So come around 6.30, walk around, hang out. At seven, we'll circle up for a Q&A. Myself, our board of directors, ask anything you want, money, finances, vision, carpet, whatever um, it is. 
and then after that, we'll just worship. And I promise it will not be some emotional rah-rah pitch thing at all. We just want to worship in that space and see what it feels like. And if, not, if, we, if nothing comes out of this other than we worship together, we pray, we make a decision together as a community, and we decide no, but like God has done something in us, beautiful, that's a win. I, I think this is an amazing opportunity, but I also feel relaxed. Not relaxed in a bad way, but in a like, man, that's, I can't wait to see what you think and what you say. And um, so we'll host that Wednesday night. Please make every effort. I know it's just a few days away from now and you have things on the docket, but please make every effort. If your community has dinner on Wednesday night, please just come to that instead. Ask questions, see, worship, sing. We'll create a little space to listen to God, prophesy, pray. We'll pray over Pastor Martin. And again, our attempt is just over the next month to discern what God is saying to our community, and the dream would be about a month from now to make a decision. So we want to solicit your feedback. Please, over the next month, we just want you to get back to us to confirm or correct. So basically, you're welcome to send the four-page email, um, but really just kind of, yeah, we think this is from God, and we'll give to it, because if we don't give to it, this won't happen. Um, or no, we don't think it's from God, and no. And so either if you just chat to any one of our staff leaders on Sunday, if you know one of our leaders or somebody on our board, feel free to just to email direct, or there's a feedback form. If you go to our website, there's a, on the homepage right now, there's a link with pictures of the space, details, address. There's a feedback form there to send in. And then in a few weeks, we'll ask all of our 70 communities to send in kind of a summary email, um, have a conversation as a community, and hopefully you're semi on the same page and just kind of send in what your gist is. And over the next few weeks, our prayer, this should be fun. This should be a faith exercise. I hope that you pray. I hope that you fast. I hope that you take this seriously, whatever we decide, and that we together as a, as a church um, discern to the best of our ability what it is that Jesus has for us with this in the year ahead. There are tons of other things coming down the pipeline this year, Holy Spirit Conference, a Praxis course on faith and work, justice stuff, but those are the main five things that we want you to track with. One more time, let's just stand together. We're just about done. And let me just say one last time, the vision for our church is not to buy a building this year. That is, I, I think, amazing, and I'm really excited to see what happens with that, and I, th I think it's from God. But the vision for our church is to be with Jesus, to become like him over the next year more than we were last year, that a year from now you say, man, this part of me was transformed, this part of me was set free, I have a new depth of healing in this area of my life. And the goal is just to be about the kind of stuff that Jesus is about in our city. That, that is what we're about. Everything else, all the practices, Alpha, Basics, Community, Holiday Park, the building, all of it is a means to an end, to apprentice under Jesus together and to see his kingdom come into this city. We love you. We're so proud of you. Just, I can't. It is such an honor for me to pastor with you and just be a part of our community. We commit Jesus to you, this decision. We commit the year ahead to you. We commit our life in community. We commit our own.